up hello it's katie colson here welcome to or welcome back to my channel and today we're going to talk about the 11 books that i managed to finish in january <laughs> Now, 11 for me personally is on the lower side, but life, listen, the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023 was coming directly from my throat. It had my throat in its claws and it wouldn't let go. I was going through a lot of things. So I miraculously finished 11 books this month and I'm proud of that. Anyway, before we get into the 11 books that I somehow managed to finish, in the month of January, we need to talk about the sponsor of today's video, which is Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a crazy popular online book subscription service where they provide five to seven new and even like early release titles every month. They take the guesswork out of what's going to be your next best read so that you can spend less time researching what book you're going to pick up next and more time actually reading. They're also completely risk-free, so if for any reason you can't pick a book up that month, you can always hit skip and you will not be charged. You can use my code Katie to get your first book for $9.99, which is the absolute lowest price that you're going to find out there for new hardcover release fiction. My February selections include Mame by Jessica George, and this follows a Ghanaian woman living in London, and she is the primary caregiver to her father who has advanced stage Parkinson's. This says that it's about female pleasure, it is about racism, and it's about the powerful impact of friendship. And honestly, that would have sold me if this cover hadn't already done it. My other selection is Julia Bart's The Writing Retreat. So this is a psychological suspense story, and it is about a young author who gets the opportunity to go on this writing retreat, where all of the competitors have to write a complete novel in one month. And whoever's novel is the best is going to win a seven-figure publishing deal. And then one of the writers just up and disappears. Oh, and the mansion is haunted. What could go wrong? If you want to check out either of these books, don't forget to use the code Katie. And thank you once again, Book of the Month, for sponsoring this video. For my first read, we shouldn't be surprised anymore. We shouldn't be surprised anymore. And I'm going to say it again. I'm not telling you to read this, okay? I'm actually telling you that you're disturbed if you enjoy it. And coming from someone who was kicking their feet and squealing like a little girl while I was reading this, I say that with no shame. This is Killing Stocking, the Deluxe Edition Volume 2 by Kugi. In the first volume, we're basically following Yoon Bum, who has a thing for Sang Woo. But Sang Woo is super charming and outgoing, and Yoon Bum is like scrawny and quiet. So he thinks that stalking Sang Woo is a way better option than just like speaking to him. The stalking gets so obsessive that Yoon Bum breaks into Sang Woo's house one day because he just wants to like smell his clothes and smell his sheets and stuff. But when he breaks in, he realizes that Sangwoo is not the idol that he had fantasized. No, Sangwoo is a sicko, okay? And when Sangwoo comes home and sees that Yoon Bum has discovered his secret, he does things. He does things that I will not discuss. Kuki, he was doing things in the series that almost no author is brave enough to talk about. This is messed up. It is not supposed to be palatable. It's not supposed to be fun. It is supposed to be twisted and mentally decrepit, but it's also brilliant because I love in this one how things all come around. I am obsessed. And now with this one, I'm halfway through the series because there's going to be four deluxe editions and I cannot wait to see how this is going to end. So obviously I gave this five stars. And then I read this. Krampus, the Yule Lord, by our sweet baby, Brom. Uh, this is about Jesse, who is a struggling, pathetic songwriter who stumbles upon a magical sack, okay? But the magical sack was dropped by this giant dude in a red suit on a sleigh that's being pulled by eight reindeer. Are you catching the clues? Yep, you're right. It's good old Kris Kringle. This magical sack throws Jesse into the path of Krampus, who hates Santa. No, I mean like they've got beef. But as we're following Krampus on his ugh, devout determination to murder Saint Nick, we're discovering that Santa Claus is not the sweet jolly man that we thought he was and he actually imprisoned Krampus half a millennium ago and stole his magic. I gave this two stars because I kind of want to give it one star but I love Brahm so I'm gonna give it two stars 
But this book would never end. It would never end. I started reading this in December of 2022 and it would never end. I drug my feet into 2023 with this book and I just, I wanted it to be over. And it ended, here's the thing, the story ended so many times, but the book didn't end. Why? I don't know. I think that this should have been a novella. And it was like he was writing the same scene over and over and over and over and over again. For what? Like, I, I don't understand. And the thing is, Krampus and Saint Nick are both despicable characters. They're despicable. I did not, I don't understand when people say that they loved Krampus. Like, no, I did not care about this war going on between Krampus and Saint Nick because the amount of times that they would fight and one of them would die, you think, and then just to pop up, again in the next chapter. And I'm like, how many times is this gonna happen? Like when I tell you it happened like seven times with each of them, where you're, where they're like celebrating because one of them is dead and then they just pop back up. Like, you thought you killed me. So while I love Brom, I do not suggest this at all. I would highly suggest Slewfoot, which I read last year and gave a glowing five stars and is an absolute success, but I would not read this. And then I read Bingo Love Jackpot Edition by T. Franklin. This is a comic and it was so lovingly sent to me by Christina, who literally in her notes said like, I know you're going through a hard time right now and I think this will really help. And she could not have been more correct about that. I cried multiple times reading this out of like the happiest way possible though. And if a book can do that, it's getting five stars. It's getting five stars. And in this, we are following, um, at the beginning, it's the in the 60s, and we're following Hazel and Mary, and they are two young Black women in high school, and they meet at a church bingo hall, and it's love at first sight. But it's the 60s, and the world is not ready for that kind of love. So their families force them apart and make them marry men. And then here's the fun thing. The fun thing about them meeting in the 60s is that when they reunite, it's decades later when they're in their 60s, okay? And they see each other and they realize that the love is very much still alive, but what are they gonna do about it? They have marriages, they have careers, they have families, they have grandchildren. Like, can, like, is the world ready for their love now? And oh my God, is this beautiful. This is so beautiful. It is stunning. It's heartwarming. It's heartbreaking. There's so many things where you'll cry because you're so happy, but then you'll cry because you're so sad. And it's just so sweet. Now here's the thing, a couple caveats. This is very jarring. Like in the timeline, every page it's jumping around from day to year, like days later, years later, months later. Like it's so choppy. And the dialogue too is very choppy, but it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me. But I recognize that, that it is a problem with the book, but I didn't care. I still loved it. And I will also say that there are a lot of bonus chapters that are in the end that are written by different authors that are completely like unnecessary but I did find really sweet so again that didn't bother me but I could definitely see it bothering somebody else but anyway I thought it was really cute and I think it needs more hype then I finally got to volume eight of Spy Family by Tetsuya Endo. Now, this is a manga that I talk so much about, so I'm gonna try to be very brief and give you a very tiny synopsis. But basically, you're following Lord Forger, he is a spy, and then he gets into like a um, assigned marriage with Yor, who turns out to be an assassin, but he doesn't know that. And then they adopt a child, Anya, who's a telepath, but they don't know that, but she knows both their secrets. And it's freaking hysterical. It is so, so funny. I gave this four stars because while this is awesome, it's fantastic, it's fun, it's funny, it's heartwarming, it's so cute. Standing this up against the other volumes, it does not compare to those five stars. So this I had to give four stars. Lloyd in this is so freaking sweet though. He's so sweet. I love that Lloyd considers being a good father part of his mission and he has to do the best job possible. That is so sweet. And your, your really shines in this volume because we get a lot of mental development and mental complexity with her because she's grappling really hard with her purpose and her worth and like whether or not she should be living the life that she's living. And obviously she perseveres because she's Thorn Princess, like duh, she's amazing. So if you haven't picked up the series yet, don't talk to me. And on to another manga, we have another absolute favorite series of mine, and that is Blood on the Tracks by Shuzo Oshimi, who is a fantastic horror mangaka. He is fantastic. And this is volume 12. So again, I'm not going to go into what it's about. The essential storyline is it's love that's gone too far. It's like a Norma and Norman Bates. And it's where you take love and it becomes a sickness and an illness and a weapon. And in 
well, no, I can't tell you anything about this one. It's literally it's volume 12. Just know that this woman scares the piss out of me. Her face alone will send me into a catatonic state. Like her eyes, terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And just to, to put this essentially, Shuzo Oshimi is a god and he wakes up every morning and chooses violence. And then I read I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman, and this was actually written in the 90s, and it's translated from French. So I read this because this was Emily Fox's best book of 2022. This is like a sci-fi dystopia where 39 women are living deep underground in a bunker watched over by guards. They have no sense of time, they have no idea how they got there, and they only have vague recollections of the life that they lived before. Now our main character is different from them because they were all in their 20s to 30s when they went into the bunker, but she was only a couple years old. So she does not remember what the outside world or what normal life is like at all. So she's a very interesting character to get the perspective of because she did not grow up going to school. She didn't grow up like learning how to read or write or do math or anything or know anything about history because she never needed to know any of those things. She's just been living the same mundane life every single day for the last, how long has it been? 12 years, I think? Yeah, like 12 years. Okay. So basically we start the story where a situation occurs in which they escape and they are trying to figure out where they are, why they're there, who put them there, what purpose did they serve in this bunker and who was it serving? And it is very interesting. And this is so short, but it packs such a huge punch. Okay. And this book is desolate. It is despondent. It is freaking sad, but it never tricks you into thinking it's going to be anything else. On the first page, this main character tells you this story doesn't have a happy ending and you need to saddle up for that and just get over it. But of course I gaslit myself into believing that things were going to change. No. When I tell you it's unique and you've never read anything like this, you have never read anything like this book. It's crazy. And the main character is so fascinating to read from because she's telling the story and because she did not grow up learning how to read or write, the way that it is being told is kind of choppy and like oddly written, but it makes sense with her developmental brain. And when I tell you it's only 188 pages and you live this in this woman's entire life and I do not feel like I missed a single moment, 188 pages and I knew this woman front to back. I knew her inexplicably. I knew everything about her. I felt like she was a real person. I felt like this was an actual memoir that I picked up. Like this book is really good. Now I will say, I never felt happy reading this book. I was consistently confused and frustrated and pondering and curious about what was going to happen and always being left wanting, like consistently being left wanting. So this is five stars critically. Critically, this is five stars. And for a sci-fi dystopia, this is five stars. But it's a four star for vibes. And then I read Hellbent. I read this book. And it took me so long. This is happening a lot this month. Books taking a really long time for me to read, okay? Uh, I was reading this for 10 days. I want to say 10 days. And everybody else is saying that this book is so fast paced and takes no time to read. I feel the exact opposite of that, okay? Now, I'm gonna preface this before I get into it by saying, I don't think this book is bad, but it was a huge disappointment for me. And I hate to say that because I loved Ninth House. But this, this is set at Yale and their deep underground seedy societies of magic that are happening at Yale, okay? But these frats basically have a bit of a ghost problem. So they need someone like Alex Stern, the main character who can see ghosts, and is also a bit of a badass to help keep these ghosties at bay. Now, this is the second book. In Ninth House, our supposed other main character, Darlington, though he's barely ever on page. I have nothing wrong with Darlington. I think Darlington's awesome. But when I tell you he barely is a featured extra in the first and second book, and he's supposed to be the other main character, like... I don't know about that. I would say Pamela Dawes is the other main character, but Lee Bardugo backburners her, which is um, disgusting, but whatever. I still love Lee Bardugo. Basically, Darlington winds up in hell. This entire 450 page tome is all about saving this grown man. That's literally all that happens, okay? And I'm telling you, there's no other plot. And I like him, but this should have had another plot. And the, uh, the crimes, like the other plot, the ghost stuff that's happening, was completely irrelevant in my opinion. It served nothing to the overall plot. 
Um, Darlington going to hell served nothing for the overall plot. Like, in my opinion, I mean, I get that, like, it changed him and stuff, but, like, okay. And here's the thing. This is going to be a trilogy. You spent a third of this overall series on one quest. That's it. What's the third book going to be about? What is the third book going to be about? We literally spent this entire second book doing fuck all. We were doing nothing. We were doing nothing. Okay, I'm sorry. And also, let's talk about Pamela Dawes. Let's talk about Oculus, which is the coolest name I've ever heard. Um, she is amazing. A shining beacon amongst all these just murderous, morally effed up cretins. Who I love. I do love all the characters. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, Turner is the hottest character. Check your facts, okay? Turner is so hot. I'm literally obsessed with him. Alex is amazing. Dawes is amazing. Darlington is amazing. But oh my God, was this book boring. It was so boring. It was so boring. Like the only, there was only one scene where I was like so freaking invested. And it was when um, there's a part where Alex is seeing into the minds of some other characters and seeing like what they believe to be like the worst thing they've ever done. That was interesting. Oh, I loved that. Anyway... I'm not saying this is bad, but it's two stars, and I found it very disappointing. Next, I read the newest installment in the Wayward Children series by Shona McGuire, and that is Lost in the Moment and Found, which is the eighth book in the Wayward Children series. This series is a portal fantasy, and each book is either following the group at Eleanor West's home for Wayward Children, or it is following a standalone just story about one particular character, which is the case with this. We're following Antoinette or Ansi, who we were introduced to in Where the Drowned Girls Go. And I love all the tie-ins that you get with all the books, which is so exciting. And this one has loads of Easter eggs because basically Ansi, she has something stolen from her when she's five years old. And on the heels of that grief, something just as precious is taken from her, her innocence. And she's running away from a situation that she should never have been put in in the first place. And while running away, she stumbles upon a door that leads to a magical shop where doors appear that lead to magical shops in other magical worlds, some of which are familiar to us, which is very exciting. But the thing is, stepping through these doors exacts a price, a price that she is not aware of while she's doing it. This is a story about how vulnerable and important childhood is and how once it's gone, you can never get it back. Shannon McGuire is not scared. She has never been scared a day in her life. This series revolves around young children, but she is not afraid to go dark. She is not afraid. It will be all whimsy and sunshine and fantasy and rainbows, and then she'll just throw gore in there without a second thought because this does deal with manipulation, uh, grooming, gaslighting, uh, implied sexual situations. This does also talk about the manipulation of a adult child dynamic and how horrible that is. And Shauna McGuire does this with such realism and beauty and grace. And it's just absolutely astonishing to watch her talk about topics that are so heavy and do it in such a needed way, because this is a story that needed to be written and needed to be said. And this reminds us that we need to teach children that they don't always need to be nice to adults if they feel unsafe. They don't need to be quiet and shy and just do what an adult, adult says just because they're an adult. You do not have to respect an adult just because they're older than you. That is not the case. And Shauna McGuire just does it so well, and she shows you that sometimes running is the best option that you have. So yes, while I would comparatively to some of the other books, I would say this was like a four and a half, or maybe even a four, probably a four and a half, but as a standalone book, five stars. And then I read Cat Diary by Junji Ito, Yan and Mew. So this is about Junji Ito as an actual human being. He is a very, very famous horror mangaka, okay? This is about him and about how his fiance really wants a cat, but he doesn't want a cat. And she like convinces him to get one. But then he finds himself like desperate for this cat to love him because he ends up loving this cat and he didn't think he would. And then his fiance is like, okay, now I want another cat because that cat needs a friend. But then both of these cats like act like they don't like him, which is like a cat thing, you know? And how messed up in his brain he gets about that. I do not know what y'all are talking about. This has an amazing rating on Goodreads, like amazing. I don't really get it. I don't get it. Um, 
I don't get the fascination with this. It was fine. It was fine. Um, and I like Genji Ito. I gave this three stars. It's fine. Um, but the one thing I really didn't like about this is that a lot of this story is an interview with Genji Ito. Like there's just questions and then his answers and they're not illustrated or anything. It's just random questions about himself and his life. And okay, but that's not what I bought this for. I didn't buy this for like an, a magazine article about Junji Ito. Like, so that took up like half of this book. And the stuff, the other half that was about Yan and Mew, I did think was interesting and cute and creepy and good. But I can't give it more than three stars because this says Cat Diary. It doesn't say Junji Ito interview. And then a very anticipatory release is Grady Hendrix's How to Sell a Haunted House. This is a horror comedy, and this is about Louise, who just found out that her parents have died. Now, while dealing with that sudden and horrible grief of both her parents dying on the same night, she's also having to deal with forcibly being reconnected to her brother, Mark, who she has not spoken to in years. Now, they have a very bad relationship that was always fraught with tension, and all of their childhood squabbles are resurfacing as they are trying to work together to sell this house. Which, as it turns out, as you could probably infer from the title, is haunted. Now, side note, the mom was a puppeteer, and she was obsessed with dolls. So the house is covered in creepy-ass dolls and puppets and taxidermy. So that's fun. I don't understand why the title of this is How to Sell a Haunted House, when really it should have been Pupkin, the creepy ass doll that my mom made me talk to like it was a real boy my entire childhood. Pupkin is the main character of this book. Now the thing is, he doesn't get introduced until like 130 pages in. He doesn't get introduced the first third of this book. Now the first third of this book was five freaking stars. I adored the beginning of this book. I was highlighting, I highlighted throughout this whole book. I absolutely loved the beginning. There was a scene with squirrels where I dropped the book on the ground. Like that's how scary it was genuinely. And then all of a sudden the entire story becomes about Pupkin. I did not think Pupkin was scary. I didn't think Pupkin was scary. I found him obnoxious and annoying. Like he literally acts like a five-year-old little boy and it's so, it's so frustrating. And this is why I would tell you not to listen to the audiobook because I physically read this and at parts I tried to listen to the audiobook and the way that the narrator narrates Pupkin while it makes sense, because that is the way that he comes off in the book, it hurt to listen to it, so I had to stop. It hurt. Like, reading it was bad, but hearing it dramatized was horrible, and I just really did not like that. There were things I liked about this book, but the puppet thing being the main point of the story, I did not like it. So I ended up giving it three stars, even though the book is actually a two star in my opinion, but I loved the first third so much that I'm gonna give it three stars. And the last book that I read this month was actually the one that I read for the Smut Salon book club on my Patreon, and that is Vicious by V.E. Schwab. This is one of my favorite books ever. I'm literally obsessed with it, and it's no shock that on my fourth read of this book, I also gave it five stars. I thought everybody had read this book. Like, I genuinely thought everyone had read this. The first time I read it was 2015, but there were so many people on my Patreon that had never read this book. And I was like, okay, well, we're rectifying that immediately, immediately. This is V.E. Schwab at her freaking best. At her freaking best. This and The Invisible Life, Addie LaRue. The writing. The writing is stunning. And this was her first adult novel. Her first adult novel? Like, when you read the writing in this, you will never believe that somebody had not been creating this kind of content for years and years and years. So this is like a superhero, like a dark, messed up superhero kind of story where you're following these two characters Eli Ever and Victor Vale while they're in college and they're in this medical pro medical program where they are constantly competing for top of the class or valedictorian. Now when the professor brings up what their thesis statement is going to be, Eli introduces the theory that he has that EOs or extraordinary people actually exist and that he wants to try and create one through a near-death experience. Now Victor, that sparks his interest because he's honestly obsessed sociopathically obsessed with Eli and everything he does. So he goes to him and is like, this sounds really interesting. You're not going to leave me in the dust. I want to join you. Let's do this experiment together. So basically what they believe is that if a human being under the 
exact just right circumstances and conditions has a near death experience when they are revived can come back and develop extraordinary abilities. So basically X-Men. Okay. And they set out to do this experiment and things go horribly, horribly wrong. And we're following two different timelines. Okay. We're following uh, 10 years ago when they're in college and what happened to make them turn out the way that they did. And then 10 years later, when Victor breaks out of prison on the sole determination to murder Eli ever. Like it is the only thing he cares about is killing this man. Okay. And it is so fascinating. And this is okay. A direct homage to Charles Xavier and Magneto. It's even referenced in the book. Like there's no second guessing it. That's exactly what it is. And I adore this mainly for the writing, the writing, the concept, it's so freaking good. But one of the best parts about this book is that it's like this asexual, aromantic, intellectual, obsessive love between Eli and Victor, where they don't feel like love and companionship and friendship the way that other people do, but they are so obsessed with each other's minds. And it's amazing. Like that's all they can think about is each other. And it's very reminiscent of Batman and the Joker, uh, where they are constantly trying to one up each other and are constantly like trying to kill each other, but they don't actually want the other one to die because if the other one dies, then what's the point? Like, what's the point in living? Because the other person is the only one who's an actual opponent for them and is smart enough to be a threat. So it's so freaking good. How Eli is like this cult leader-esque, like very charming, can put the mask on, can play up emotions, like can very easily mimic emotions. Where Victor is very cold and calculating and Sherlockian. That is not a word. He's Sherlock-esque. Sherlockian. I was really trying to be a wordsmith there. Um, he's very like Sherlock and he cannot mimic emotions very well and it's very hard for him to mask. But he is like obsessed with watching Eli and seeing the cracks in his facade and seeing like the demon that's actually underneath because nobody else sees it but him. And when I tell you this is five star, when I tell you this is five star, it's so freaking good. Like I'm I'm obsessed with this book. Okay, that is the 11 books that I read in January. But thank you so much for watching this video. If you got this far, leave the pink heart with the little twinkles. Leave that emoji if you're not sure what else to leave and you want to let me know that you're here supporting me this far into the video. If you want to follow me on Goodreads, Instagram, Patreon, or any of the like, all of those links are going to be down below. And if you want to subscribe, you totally could. If you want to like this video, I mean, like, that's within your power. That's all I'm saying. But anyway... I hope that all of you are having an amazing day, evening, night, dusk, dawn, whatever it is you're having in whatever part of the world you are currently having it in. And I will see you in a video coming very soon. Bye.